China for its actions towards Hong Kong. It will also take questions undoubtedly about the trouble in Minneapolis. Here's President Trump. Thank you. I'm here today to talk about our relationship with China and several new measures to protect American security and prosperity. China's pattern of misconduct is well known. For decades, they've ripped off the United States like no one has ever done before. Hundreds of billions of dollars a year were lost dealing with China, especially over the years during the prior administration. China raided our factories, offshored our jobs, gutted our industries, stole our intellectual property, and violated their commitments under the World Trade Organization. To make matters worse, they are considered a developing nation, getting all sorts of benefits that others, including the United States, are not entitled to. But I have never solely blamed China for this. They were able to get away with the theft like no one was able to get away with before because of past politicians and, frankly, past presidents. But unlike those who came before, my administration negotiated and fought for what was right. It's called fair and reciprocal treatment. China has also unlawfully claimed territory in the Pacific Ocean, threatening freedom of navigation and international trade. And they broke their word to the world on ensuring the autonomy of Hong Kong. The United States wants an open and constructive relationship with China, but achieving that relationship requires us to vigorously defend our national interests. The Chinese government has continually violated its promises to us and so many other nations. These plain facts cannot be overlooked or swept aside. The world is now suffering as a result of the malfeasance of the Chinese government. China's cover-up of the Wuhan virus allowed the disease to spread all over the world, instigating a global pandemic that has cost more than 100,000 American lives and over a million lives worldwide. Chinese officials ignored their reporting obligations to the World Health Organization and pressured the World Health Organization to mislead the world when the virus was first discovered by Chinese authorities. Countless lives have been taken and profound economic hardship has been inflicted all around the globe. They strongly recommended against me doing the early ban from China, but I did it anyway and was proven to be 100 percent correct. China has total control over the World Health Organization, despite only paying $40 million per year compared to what the United States has been paying, which is approximately $450 million a year. We have detailed the reforms that it must make and engage with them directly, but they have refused to act. Because they have failed to make the requested and greatly needed reforms, we will be today terminating our relationship with the World Health Organization and redirecting those funds to other worldwide and deserving urgent global public health needs. The world needs answers from China on the virus. We must have transparency. Why is it that China shut off infected people from Wuhan to all other parts of China? It went nowhere else. It didn't go to Beijing. It went nowhere else. But they allowed them to freely travel throughout the world, including Europe and the United States. The death and destruction caused by this is incalculable. We must have answers, not only for us, but for the rest of the world. This pandemic has underscored the crucial importance of building up America's economic independence, reshoring our critical supply chains, and protecting America's scientific and technological advances. For years, the government of China has conducted illicit espionage to steal our industrial secrets, of which there are many. Today, I will issue a proclamation to better secure our nation's vital university research and to suspend the entry of certain foreign nationals from China who we have identified as potential security risks. 
I am also taking action to protect the integrity of America's financial system, by far the best in the world. I am instructing my presidential working group on financial markets to study the differing practices of Chinese companies listed on the U.S. financial markets with the goal of protecting American investors. Investment firms should not be subjecting their clients to the hidden and undue risks associated with financing Chinese companies that do not play by the same rules. Americans are entitled to fairness and transparency. Several of the most significant actions we're taking pertain to deeply troubling situations unfolding in Hong Kong. This week, China unilaterally imposed control over Hong Kong security. This was a plain violation of Beijing's treaty obligations with the United Kingdom in the Declaration of 1984 and explicit provisions of Hong Kong's basic law. It has 27 years to go. The Chinese government's move against Hong Kong is the latest in a series of measures that are diminishing the city's long-standing and very proud status. This is a tragedy for the people of Hong Kong, the people of China, and indeed the people of the world. China claims it is protecting national security. But the truth is that Hong Kong was secure and prosperous as a free society. Beijing's decision reverses all of that. It extends the reach of China's invasive state security apparatus into what was formerly a bastion of liberty. China's latest incursion, along with other recent developments that degraded the territory's freedoms, makes clear that Hong Kong is no longer sufficiently autonomous to warrant the special treatment that we have afforded the territory since the handover. China has replaced its promised formula of one country, two systems, with one country, one system. Therefore, I am directing my administration to begin the process of eliminating policy exemptions that give Hong Kong different and special treatment. My announcement today will affect the full range of agreements we have with Hong Kong, from our extradition treaty to our export controls, on dual-use technologies and more, with few exceptions. We will be revising the State Department's travel advisory for Hong Kong to reflect the increased danger of surveillance and punishment by the Chinese state security apparatus. We will take action to revoke Hong Kong's preferential treatment as a separate customs and travel territory from the rest of China. The United States will also take necessary steps to sanction PRC and Hong Kong officials directly or indirectly involved in eroding Hong Kong's autonomy and, so, and just, if you take a look, smothering, absolutely smothering Hong Kong's freedom. Our actions will be strong. Our actions will be meaningful. More than two decades ago, on a rainy night in 1997, British soldiers lowered the Union flag and Chinese soldiers raised the Chinese flag in Hong Kong. The people of Hong Kong felt simultaneously proud of their Chinese heritage and their unique Hong Kong identity. The people of Hong Kong hoped that in the years and decades to come, China would increasingly come to resemble its most radiant and dynamic city. The rest of the world was electrified by a sense of optimism that Hong Kong was a glimpse into China's future, not that Hong Kong would grow into a reflection of China's past. In every decision, I will continue to proudly defend and protect the workers, families, and citizens of the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so there is President Trump with some major news uh, and really squaring off against China, escalating not just a war of words, but now a full-on economic assault uh, against Beijing. He is, first, he has cut off all funding uh, from the U.S. to the World Health Organization. The U.S. is pulling out 
of the World Health Organization. According to President Trump, uh, that effective right away, he believes, as he said in the Rose Garden, that the World Health Organization uh, is basically a tool of China. On China, the president uh, excoriated China's decision to extend national security law over Hong Kong. And he responded by saying that he will deny visas to certain Chinese nationals uh, and also change the treatment of China on American financial markets. The, these are important issues for investors uh, as they go. This is an attempt by the president really to take on China economically. And he also, as he has many times before, blamed China for the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. So the president cutting off U.S. funding and support for the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic and taking on China on a number of fronts economically. I, I want to go to our uh, Martha Raddatz, who has been standing by watching this. You know, this was billed, Martha, as something of a, a small bore response that the president had to China's action against Hong Kong. But it feels to me like this is something more major. Well, he, he's certainly been focusing on China, as we know, uh, since the pandemic began, and in some ways distracting from the pandemic by focusing on China. But he's absolutely right that China is smothering Hong Kong and that they will focus on that more. The administration will now focus on that more. But as you heard there, Terry, at the very beginning, again, he's a, he talks about Wuhan and that lab in Wuhan and uh, WHO as well. I think that was not entirely Entirely surprising. He has been talking about the World Health Organization and how disappointed he was in that organization and their response, and he's taking action today. Of course, I think we all expected more uh, from the president today and certainly to talk uh, about Minnesota and about what is happening there and those protests and those very controversial tweets he has had in the last 24 hours, Terry. Absolutely, Martha. He took no questions on a day when Minneapolis and the country are in a kind of agony over what's happened in that city over the past week. The president of the United States not saying a word about it. Uh, Pierre Thomas is with us on that. Pierre, uh, the attorney general of the United States, William Barr, did issue a statement on this. The arresting officer, the man who was seen in that video with his knee, on George Floyd's neck uh, has been arrested and charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Uh, where do we go from here with the Justice Department, with Attorney General William Barr issuing a statement? Well, Terry, I was just reading through it uh, when you began talking, and the Attorney General used some very strong language um, for him anyway. He described uh, the situation in looking at the video. He made clear that he's watched the video of Mr. Floyd's death, and he called it harrowing. Uh, he called it basically very disturbing. He pointed out that there's a parallel uh, FBI and Justice Department investigation ongoing, uh, and that he believes that justice will be served. Uh, he's very confident in that, he said. Now, the interesting thing he did point out is that the Justice Department action would likely come after the state charges are, are, are put forth. Uh, I don't know if that means if they're all the charges from the state have to be filed before the Justice Department does anything, but he pointed out that the state action would likely come first. But clearly, this has caught the attention of the attorney general. He knows this is a national story. It has major implications in terms of what that video says about race and policing. The Justice Department is responding. A lot of work to do on their end. He talked about the fact that the FBI would be gathering additional evidence, uh, again, in parallel with what the state officials are doing, Terry. All right, Pierre, thank you. I want to go to Cecilia Vega on what we just heard and did not hear from President Trump, Cecilia. There are the reporters. This was supposed to be a press conference. By tradition, that means the press asks questions, doesn't just act as props. What did you make of what we saw? I, I, I'll be frank, Terry. I'm, I'm a little bit speechless, uh, and it takes a lot to be speechless <laughs> these days. Um, the silence, uh, frankly, is astounding. We've got a nation... Uh, that is on edge. I don't even know if that goes far, th far enough to describe uh, how divided, how outraged, how enraged uh, the country is right now, uh, let alone specifically the city of Minneapolis and particularly African-Americans in our country. And the president didn't 
utter a single word about what is happening there right now. He didn't mention the name George Floyd. He didn't say anything about the arrest that had just happened. He didn't say anything about what sort of justice he would like to see carried out. Uh, yes, everything you and Martha said at the top of this regarding uh, relating to China, this is huge news. The, the White House, the administration pulling out of the WHO uh, in the middle of a global pandemic uh, has huge implications. But the silence, what was not said in the Rose Garden right now, is frankly uh, astounding. And I, I don't think, I, I can't imagine any other president, frankly, walking out in the middle of a national crisis like the one that we are living through today and not acknowledging it to the country. He has obviously spoken about it on Twitter, as we've talked about. And there's no question the confrontation with China over Hong Kong and over other matters is very, very important. Do you think that in bashing China, the president is also trying to score some political points, uh, reminding people why many of them supported them to begin with and taking on China and the globalization uh, consensus that ruled in Washington? Is he playing politics, do you think, a little bit with this? There's cer certainly politics at play here. Uh, there are there's still uh, trade negotiations going on with China uh, that the president is is working his way through. Uh, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, he called this the Wuhan virus to begin with. So he is looking to shift blame as we are still in the middle of this uh, coronavirus crisis also here in this country. Um, certainly, this is about politics in the middle of everything that is going on, in the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of what's happening in and, and this, this crisis, this moment of crisis that our nation is living through uh, in Minneapolis, we sort of forget it is an election year. Uh, we are looking at five months away from an election, and all of this comes into play uh, at that. But really, to me, Terry, the headline right now is what was not said in the Rose Garden just a few minutes ago. All right. Cecilia Vega, thank you very much on a on an important day for the United States-China relationship with Martha Rad, it's also an important day for the presidency. As Cecilia just mentioned, we're accustomed in moments of national trauma and crisis to look to the president for words of calming, words of unifying uh, motivation, words essentially to get us through a hard time. And today the president chose to bash China. He did. And, and as Cecilia said, utter silence on what is dominating coverage in this country and the pain that the death of George Floyd caused, those protests last night. Let me remind you what the president said in his tweets. He said, when the looting stops, the shoot, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Uh, the state has now uh, sent out 500 National Guard troops into that city. The president uh, did not talk exactly about what those National Guard troops would be doing, but they are under the control of the governor, not the president of the United States. They are not part of the uh, full-time active duty military. But the president said, we need to bring the city under control. Uh, the National Guard will get the job done right. Uh, let's talk about the rules of engagement. The, the National Guard troops are armed. There are apparently some credible threats against those troops, so they are armed. And we've seen pictures. They have long weapons and, and presumably sidearms as well. They are supposed to only use lethal force in self-defense. But what those troops will be doing is putting themselves uh, between the lines of protesters and sites that might be harmed. They will also be providing security for the fire department and others. But the rules of engagement, having the commander-in-chief uh, talk about those uh, rules of engagement, essentially saying when the looting uh, starts, the shooting will start, is confusing to troops. As one former senior officer said to me, it's hard enough when you're overseas and facing the enemy. It's much more difficult when you're in the homeland facing your own citizens. Remember, uh, the, the National Guard are citizens. They live in Minnesota. They're state National Guard, Terry. And they are facing a long hard night in Minneapolis. Martha Raditz, thanks very much for that. Uh, you can follow all of these developments, get more news reports from Minneapolis, and more on what President Trump has done with the World Health Organization on China, on World News Tonight with David Muir, and of course on Nightline and all the time on all the other outlets that you can get ABC News on. Thanks for watching. I'm Terry Moran.
being live is all about. I can see me pushing through. This is ABC News Live. Neighborhoods are underwater. 24 7 streaming news source, ABC News. <laughs> Imagine breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non stop, straight to you. Imagine.